to this briefing on the INCP annual report for 2019 and also the precursors report. And I'm very happy to, to introduce uh, President uh, Cornelis uh, de, de Jonquier and uh, Barbara Remberg from the Secretariat of the International Narcotics Control Board, um, the, the President of the International Narcotics Control Board um, will be providing a briefing on the report and uh, uh, ba Barbara will um, then be able to provide a, 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 an overview of the precursors report. Of course, uh, the questions are, are most welcome from uh, the, the journalists in, in the room um, after that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Mr. President, uh, for, for the briefing, please. Thank you, Mr. Nizirki, for the uh, introduction, ladies and gentlemen. It's an, an honor to welcome you to the launch of the International Narcotics Control Board, the annual report for 2019, and the report on the Article 12 of the 1988 Convention, the so-called INCB Precursor Report. I also welcome uh, those of you who are following this uh, by the webcast. Um, just to remind us that the INCB is the independent, quasi-judicial body established under the United Nations International Drug Control Treaties to monitor their implementation by governments. And in the next couple of minutes, I will highlight some aspects of the, uh, the two reports, and then uh, we look forward to, uh, to your questions. The annual report has four chapters. Um, Basically, the chapter one is about improving substance use, prevention, and treatment for young people. The chapter two is about the functioning of the international drug control system. The chapter two is about the global issues, um, and we particularly wanted to highlight the issue on human rights and uh, drug control. And chapter four is about a set of recommendations uh, of the board. The main objective of the International Drug Control Treaties is to ensure the health and welfare of humankind through ensuring adequate availability of narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances for medical use while preventing their diversion to the non-medical use and that of the precursors to illicit drug manufacture. So let me move to um, the thematic chapter one of this year, which is about young people. So under the title Improving Substance Use and Prevention and Treatment Services for Young People, we draw attention to the use of psychoactive drugs among young people, and particularly in the age group of 15 to 24. And we draw attention to how to improve evidence-based prevention and treatment strategies for this age group. We underscore that promoting and protecting adolescent health will lead to overall greater public health and will also give great benefits to society. We have highlighted a number of actions that governments should take, such as establish mechanisms to improve the understanding of drug use and the factors that influence drug use and improve disseminating knowledge of best practices on how to counter those. Secondly, establish a focal point for primary prevention, develop a national drug control strategy and a public health framework. Thirdly, build capacity for collaboration and working together with organizations and institutions to achieve prevention aims. Fourthly, improving national training for professionals. Fifth, providing evidence-based prevention interventions for children and adolescents. And six, establish treatment and prevention services which go beyond school settings and includes a young person's family, communities, sports, and non-family arrangements. So from chapter two, I would like to draw your attention to three particular areas. One is treaty compliance. The second one has to do with ensuring the availability of internationally controlled substances and the third one is on human rights and drug control. In chapter two, we report on INCB's actions to ensure the implementation of the international drug control treaties. 
INCB stresses the importance of ensuring comprehensive implementation of the international drug conventions at the national level in order to strengthen the international drug control framework. The board remains concerned at the legislative developments in a small number of countries permitting the non-medical use of cannabis. In our report, we clearly state that these developments are contrary to the commitments those countries made with their contracting partners when agreeing to be bound by the drug control treaties. We are engaged in active dialogue with those countries in order to facilitate their return to meeting their treaty obligations. And we also express our concerns in the report about the possible consequences for health and well-being, in particularly for young people of those policies. The annual report also draws attention to the global imbalance in availability and access of controlled medicines for medical use and the urgent need to address this gap. While the availability of controlled medicines has increased globally, the unequal distribution remains. Our report shows that almost 80% of the world's population, largely living in low and middle income countries, consumed only 13% of the total amount of morphine used for the management of pain and in palliative care. That is about 1% of the morphine manufactured globally. And this slide graphically shows that. We cooperate with governments to promote the adequate availability of medicines containing controlled substances for medical and scientific use. In chapter two, we also refer to INCB's ongoing close consultations with the government of Afghanistan under Article 14 bis of the 1961 Convention. Last month, the INCB met with the government of Afghanistan to explore how the United Nations agencies could provide further support to deal with the drug control challenges the country faces. We identified a number of areas like the need for support to, uh, to further support to agricultural and marketing opportunities for alternative livelihood programs, addressing the linkages between terrorism, insurgency, corruption and drug trafficking, strengthening interdiction and investigation capacity of law enforcement to tackle drug-related offenses, including the trafficking in chemical precursors used in illicit drug production, the need for greater regional collaboration and increasing treatment and rehabilitation services for those affected by drug use disorders, including women and youth. INCB is very much aware of the extraordinary challenges on peace and sustainable development faced by the government and the people of Afghanistan. And the board will continue working with the authorities to promote the engagement of UN organs and specialized agencies. The board stresses that efforts to stabilize the country will not be sustainable without effectively addressing the illicit drugs economy. The INCB annual report 2019 also emphasizes the obligation to respect human rights in the elaboration and implementation of drug control policy. Unfortunately, human rights violations continue to take place in some countries purportedly in the name of drug control. The board categorically states that no country is exempt from human rights norms when implementing the drug control treaties. And drug control policies that protect human rights principles and standards have proved to be the most effective and sustainable. The board in its report, we make a number of recommendations in relation to human rights and the drug control conventions. Among these, we stress that drug abuse and drug related activities cannot be lawfully addressed without ensuring the protection of human rights and compliance with the international drug control conventions. In addressing drug-related criminality, states must continue to apply the principle of proportionality as a guiding principle in the determination and applying of criminal sanctions. 
And thirdly, while the treaties leave the determination of sanctions applicable to drug-related crime to the discretion of governments, INCB again urges states that retain capital punishment for drug-related offenses to consider its abolition. The treaties required governments to give special attention to the possibility of applying alternative measures to conviction, punishment, incarceration for drug-related offenses in appropriate cases and of a minor nature. And these include education, rehabilitation, social reintegration, as well as when the offender is affected by a drug disorder, treatment and aftercare. In the chapter three, we draw attention to the global synthetic opioid crisis. It is estimated that some 53 people have abused opioids in the past year. In some high income countries such as Canada and the United States, synthetic opioids such as hydrocodone, oxycodone and fentanyl are widely and readily available and their aggressive marketing and subsequent overprescription has contributed to increases in dependency, overdose and overdose death. The rate of drug overdose death in those countries has been steadily increasing since 2000. And globally, it is estimated that 66% of death attributed to drug use disorders were related to opioids. Increases in drug-related death are in part due to the emergence and abuse of illicitly manufactured fentanyl and fentanyl analogues in North America. INCB encourages the governments to work together with public health officials, pharmacists and physicians, manufacturers and distributors, consumer protection associations and law enforcement agency to promote public education about the risks associated with prescription drugs and adopt appropriate measures to decrease their abuse and potential to cause dependence. And again, at this point in time, that epidemic is very much concentrated in North America, but I think it is our responsibility to ensure that it doesn't spread any further, and we may have to make all efforts to contain that. In that respect, the Global Rapid Interdiction of Dangerous Substances, the GRITS program, is an INCB global initiative aiming at reducing the trafficking in dangerous substances focusing on new psychoactive substances, including the non-medical synthetic opioids, chemicals and equipment, and limiting their supply to consumer drug abuse markets. Drugs, uh, GRITS has been designed in response to resolutions adopted by the UN General Assembly and by the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, asking the INCB to assist in efforts to address the challenges posed by these non-scheduled substances. The GRITS program integrates and expands on a set of current INCB activities. That is the project ION, IONIX, public and private partnerships that we've been developing over the last few years, and the opioids project. To close the annual report, num uh, I would like to highlight three recommendations from the chapter four. The board urges all governments to develop national systems for the collection of data on drug use. We still see that those are, in many countries, we don't have those systems, they're absent, so we don't know really what the patterns are. Secondly, develop capacity building in the field of drug use prevention and treatment. And thirdly, implement evidence-based prevention programs for young people using a wide range of interventions in family in school and in their communities. Let me turn to the INCB report on Article 12 of the 1988 Convention. The INCB Precursors Report has established itself over the years as a reference for professionals and government authorities in the monitoring and analyzing of the latest trends in precursor control and as a practical tool for addressing emerging challenges. The starting materials used in illicit drug manufacture are often chemicals that are not under international control. 
including purpose-made designer precursors with no known legitimate use. The pace at which these non-scheduled chemicals are emerging continues to be of our great concern. Since 2018, and just over a year after placing two precursors called NPP and ANPP under international control, these were two substances suitable for the illicit manufacture of fentanyl and a number of fentanyl analogs, traffickers have already begun to seek alternative, alternative precursor chemicals. And similarly, non-scheduled chemicals are used for more sophisticated and efficient illicit cocaine processing. Diversion at national level continues to be the main source of controlled precursors used in illicit cocaine production. And as alternatives to controlled drug um, precursors continue to be sought by traffickers, the substance by substance scheduling of the 98, under the 1988 convention is a reactive rather than a proactive um, action. For the 29 precursors under international control, diversion from legitimate international trade has decreased due to the increased use by the governments of the INCB pre-export notification online, the PEN online system, and joint multi-country investigations have benefited from real-time information sharing through the INCB precursor incident communication system. This year, in the exercise of its mandate under the 88 Convention, INCB has also recommended the international control of methyl alpha phenyl acetoacetate, MAPA, a pre-precursor used for the illicit manufacture of amphetamine and methamphetamine. MAPA, again, has no known legitimate use beyond limited research and can be classified as a designer precursor. The Commission on Narcotic Drugs will decide next week upon the recommendation of the INCB. The precursor report makes a number of recommendations and among them the board calls for on the international community to engage in a global policy discussion to tackle the, emergen, the emergence of the non-scheduled designer chemical precursors. And this will also be on the agenda for the CND next week. We also call on governments to explore practical approaches to addressing challenges of collecting evidence to proving intent and knowledge in precursor-related crime. We call on governments to improve reporting to the INCB, including by providing details on the circumstances of seizures, suspected origin, and methods of diversion. And finally, we call on governments to take actions to implement the Article 13 of the 1988 Convention in preventing and investigating the diversion of essential equipment, such as tableting machines and laboratory equipment used for illicit drug manufacturing. So with this, I um, conclude my short statement and presentation of the uh, annual report and the precursor report, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So the floor is open for questions you may have. Please, I believe we have a mic microphone coming. Um, please, could you um, introduce yourself and say which uh, media organization you work for? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't work for any media organization other than the Ambassador of Colombia. And I rather have, rather than a uh, question, I have a, a small uh, declaration to, to say about the, the report, if you allow me, Mr. President. Um, um, th this is a, a, a press conference where uh, um, it's, it's w we would like to hear questions from, uh, from the media, f first of all. Um, uh, if, if there are the statements to be made uh, by, by member states, I think that they could be given to the INCB uh, the Secretariat. Um, so, so this is a... a last, last year, in this same uh, uh, event, we did... 
So, uh, let, uh, this is, I'm not saying that you, you should not. I'm, I'm simply trying to make sure that journalists, um, uh, first of all, have the chance uh, to ask of questions. Course, of course, I, I respect very much uh, uh, press liberty and press freedom, of course, but I <coughs> think uh, that the state also have something to say. And uh, what we are going to say uh, could be also interesting for, uh, for the media. Uh, but, uh, undoubtedly. I, I am undoubtedly. I, I am on your hands, uh, and I will act as you decide. But please take into account that member states have the right to do so. Thank you um, very much. Indeed, uh, Am Ambassador, and, and do, do uh, bear with me, as I would like to see whether, uh, first of all, whether the journalists um, have, have questions and uh, if, if so, that they can put the questions and then we will certainly turn, turn to you um, with, with the greatest of respect. So thank you. My name is Luis Lido from the Spanish News EMCFE. Um, in this year's report, as well as in last year, there are some criticism to uh, mm, cannabis medical program in some way. I would like if the president can elaborate about what is um, wrong in this kind of program or what, what is bad managing in, the, in this kind of program? Um, as indicated over in the report as well, over the last uh, number of years, a small number of countries have been moving towards uh, programs to legalize the use of cannabis for non-medical purposes. Um, they have used a range of arguments uh, uh, to do that um, for the board um, and in our responsibility as a board, uh, which is to monitor the implementation of the International Drug Control Conventions. That is our responsibility. And uh, these programs are not in, in compliance. They violate the, particularly the Article 4 of the 61 Convention and the Article 3 of the 1988 Conventions. So we have called the attention uh, of the international community to that. Uh, again, it's not a, an obligation to the board. Uh, countries that have signed up to the conventions, they have contracted obligations vis-a-vis -vis each other. And uh, therefore, we have uh, called uh, the attention of the, uh, the international community to that. We have indicated clearly that uh, these programs are not in line with the International Drug Control Conventions. And uh, we are, as with many other countries, we are engaged in a, in a dialogue uh, with countries on, uh, on, on these programs. Um, and um, next week there will be the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Um, as you probably know, there will be lots of discussions about recommendations on cannabis. And, uh, but that is what we've been, uh, over the last year, been, been discussing as a board and uh, what we have called attention to. The medical programs, um, sorry if I misunderstood your, your question, um, uh, cannabis is uh, in, an, in, in a large range of countries is used for medical purposes. That is a prerogative and is a decision for, uh, of countries to make that they can, um, they can use substances for, for a medical use. Uh, that is within the convention as long as they uh, comply with a series of um, specific conditions that the conventions uh, put in that respect that is uh, appropriate controls on production of cannabis, a national cannabis agency, uh, and so on and so forth. So the, the convention, particularly the 61, but also the 88 convention, puts a number of conditions to countries that, um, uh, just as with, with other controlled substances for medical use, if countries comply with that, then those medical programs are full within, uh, within, the, within the conventions. Hello, my name is Albert Otti with DPA, German Press Agency. I have one follow-up and, and one, one question of my own. Concerning the medical programs, would you say that most of the countries that have these medical programs are following the rules and protocols established by the convention? My second question is, um, when I looked through the, the drug uh, trade and trafficking trends, I saw that amphetamines came up very frequently. Would you say that this is one of the fastest growing drugs in terms of trafficking and production around the world, in terms of global spread? Yeah. On countries with um, programs for medical cannabis, um, 
um, we have a lot of uh, ongoing dialogues with countries. Um, we have a, a range of countries that have been uh, Im starting to implement these programs. Um, we are in dialogue with them then particularly on, on the conditions uh, with which they have to comply. Um, most countries are doing that well. There are, uh, for some countries, that is work in progress and uh, that is, uh, again, on, in our discussions with countries. We do that here through the permanent missions. We do it uh, when the board uh, undertakes missions to countries where we uh, discuss with the national authorities the, uh, uh, the conditions under which these programs are, are being made. Um, but in principle, um, uh, again, we, we try to make sure that all countries that go uh, into a national medical cannabis program, that they know what the rules and regulations under the conventions are, and we do our utmost uh, you know, to ensure that countries comply with them. And of course, countries will do the utmost to, uh, to do that. Um, under, under amphetamine and methamphetamine, um, always difficult uh, to, to get precise figures on that, but uh, yes, indeed, I think it is uh, of great concern to the board uh, what is happening, not just in many of the Asian countries, but also the increasing uh, uh, illicit trafficking and use of uh, methamphetamine um, also in, in, in Latin and in, in, in North America and also increasingly in, uh, in Europe. So I think, um, and this, has, this appears to be a trend that has been fairly recent and uh, with a, a rapid increase. And I think it is something that we have also called attention to in the annual report um, in the, the chapter three under some of the global issues. And it is something that um, uh, we also, um, particularly uh, with the precursor program that we, uh, therefore we put a lot of emphasis on this, that the, uh, the, the, the upsurge in, not just in methamphetamine, but surely many more synthetic drugs to come is really rapidly changing the face of the international drug control problem, and uh, therefore we're very keen to uh, to address these uh, to address this. Thank you. Further questions, um, please, uh, Luis. Um, when you say that the board is worried about the effect of the legalization in some countries like Canada. You are saying that uh, this legalization is uh, increasing the consumption among young people, because uh, I, I think it, this is what the, the report is saying, but I would like to, if you could elaborate about that. And other point is that in some way, um, uh, last year was more clear on the, uh, that the board had decided the uh, medical program some in some countries because it, it was some kind of um, a, a, a view and it was um, a step before um, the recreational legalization of if it's not well managed because it, it this this view of that cannabis is not so bad On um, the concern is that, um, uh, again, I think that's probably everybody's concern. <coughs> there are two things. Within the, the, the framework of the convention, the conventions clearly limit the, uh, the, the use of cannabis and other substances to, to, to medical use. So the conventions do not allow these substances to be used for, for non-medical purposes. Now, what happens, and uh, that is particularly those countries that are moving in that direction, um, as far as we can see and uh, what we have, um, what we read and what, what is in our dialogue, obviously many countries are um, setting up programs to evaluate the effects of that. I think in that, uh, in that respect, the jury is, uh, is still out. We will have to see how that works. But that doesn't take away anything from the fact that conventions as such say that the, the, the non-medical use of cannabis is, is, is in violation of the, uh, of the convention, irrespectively of the, the public health outcomes of, of it. So I think we should, um, they're of course important to, uh, to know what the public health outcomes will be, um, but uh, at this point in time, we, we are dealing with also a, a legal uh, and a political obligation of countries that have signed up to, uh, uh, to the treaties. So I think that is the, uh, that's the important uh, uh, part at where we are now. 
And again, it doesn't take away anything from the, uh, the fact that um, countries that are putting in place uh, those programs uh, will uh, look at consequences in terms of public health. They will look to consequences in terms of um, uh, um, limiting uh, trafficking and reducing the illegal market. So those countries, as far as we can see, are putting in, in place a, num a set of indicators which obviously are important to, uh, uh, to, to follow. Now in terms of the, uh, um, again, coming back to the medical programs and uh, what we wrote in last year's report, again, if medical programs are not appropriately set up and if, um, if they don't comply with a set of conditions that are being stipulated under the conventions, if there's not appropriate communication around the specific objectives and uh, the use of, of medical cannabis, there are risks involved that it may uh, it, that it may lead to uh, a, a blurring the boundaries of medical and, and non-medical cannabis. So that was more the concern that was expressed. But as these are all, you know, in many countries, these are new programs, um, a, a, again, you, you don't have the hard data yet to make those judgments, but you're more, it's more a pre-warning about uh, risk that may be associated with those programs if they are not being appropriately set up and implemented. Further questions? Uh, please, Albert. Sure, can you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you very much. Um, I have one more question on uh, youth. Um, you write that there is a strong link between um, use of tobacco and alcohol and drugs among youth, but you don't say there is a causal link, you just say there is a link, which suggests to me there is just a correlation um, aren't you overstating the link? Aren't you, you know, m my feeling is that you're suggesting there's a causal link, but statistically there is probably none. Is that, what's the situation there? Um, I, I don't know, I, I don't think we're overstating it. Uh, um, I, th I think we've used as much as we, uh, as, as we could. Um, we've used the evidence that is currently uh, uh, available on, uh, on this, but at the same point in time, I think um, these are complicated issues to research. I think it may very well be that um, um, those linkages may play out differently in different parts of the world. Um, very often when we, um, and we've seen that with a number of the, uh, the thematic chapters that we have, um, as soon as we start looking for information and evidence on these, we're very much link we're very much limited to certain parts of the world where that uh, those investigations are are ongoing and where these studies are being done and um, this only covers a small part of the world population and uh, therefore um, we constantly uh, you know we are calling for uh, better and more systematic data collection in in many more parts of the world that will allow us to um, you know, to have better data uh, for better policy making in that respect. So I very much, um, you know, appreciate the, um, the limitations that we have. We, uh, we look at um, the limited evidence that, uh, that there is, but that is the best conclusions that we can take at this point in time. Further questions? Uh, please, Louis. You mentioned that uh, you uh, use data of Canada, that the first time cannabis consumer has doubled uh, in if you compare the time of the legalization of cannabis in Canada with the year before the same. Yeah. Um, I would like to, to um, if you could elaborate about what you see uh, that is so so bad for the for young people in the uh, in the case of uh, legalization of cannabis. I don't know if it's that um, people has the sense the feeling that it's not so harmful uh, as it is, or because uh, I I mean in the in the report you use some data pointing in some direction that uh, indicate that uh, that there are is an increase in consumption among young people, but I don't see the whole argumentation 
as elaborate uh, uh, as it should be. And then I would like if you could elaborate uh, somehow what you see so bad for those people, uh, how it impacts uh, the, the legalization in, in those people, this, this kind of policy. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I, I, I think we have to, to go a, a step yeah. back again because um, you know, it's, it's not the board that says that um, uh, legalization of cannabis is, is bad for, uh, you know, there is a legal obligation that countries have contracted together and vis-a-vis -vis each other in signing up to the conventions. It can, they have collectively, countries have decided that, uh, um, that there are limits and that there are a set of, of, of rules and agreements that they have made uh, that limits the use of these substances to, to medical use. Within the conventions, countries have said, you, the board, you have to, to monitor whether we as countries are implementing those conventions. That is what we're saying as a, as a board now. We are seeing that there are certain countries that are not complying with their obligations under the conventions. Um, and we're calling the attention of the international community to that. Um, uh, that is independent from, you know, ultimately the public health or the individual health effects of that, those actions taking place or, or whether it may uh, negatively or positively affect the illegal market or trafficking or whatever. It is purely uh, a call uh, of the board to the international community that um, uh, an obligation under the convention is not being followed by uh, a set of uh, a set of member states. Again, those member states have clear arguments why they think they uh, are doing this, and uh, um, some of those countries, and, and in fact, I think most of them are putting in place uh, monitoring programs themselves to see what the implications of that are. But that is again that is independent from the legal obligations that countries have contracted vis-à-vis uh, -vis each other. And uh, so that is what we are, that is our role as a board to, uh, um, you know, to call the attention of the international community uh, uh, to that. Um, I'm sure that the international community at the same time, uh, considering, you know, the, the extent and the, 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 the huge, um, you know, implications of the world drug problem, um, obviously will, uh, will be interested in, uh, in, in looking at all kind of different measures and law enforcement and ways of dealing with the, with the world drug problem as we see it. Therefore, we've also presented you know, some of the new programs that we are involved in, uh, particularly with respect to the, to the synthetic drugs, because we see that the nature of the world drug problem is, is changing. Um, that uh, and that may also have uh, you know we need to see whether uh, the instruments that the conventions um, provide and and the tools that the international community has available under the convention whether those are fit for purpose to address these problems. But again, it, with related with relation to cannabis, it's 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 uh, clearly an issue of the board calling attention of the international community that that obligation is is not being followed at the moment. Yeah. Albert, please. Sorry, I, I, I feel I have to follow up on, on, that, on that question. I think the question was not so much why you are talking about uh, honoring the obligations. I mean, it's, we all know what the INCB is and does. The question was whether you have anything today to say as the INCB on potential health implications because the INCB is not composed, because the INCB is composed, at least some of you, some of your members are public health experts. If your only job was to monitor the, the treaty from a legal standpoint, there would be no need to have health, health experts on there. You just need international lawyers. So as, as you are also a health, as your work has also a health aspect, the question is, do you have anything to say on the potential risks of cannabis legalization from a health, public health perspective? Well, uh, I, I, I Obviously, uh, obviously we have, but the, the, the whole point is again that those countries that, have, that are moving or have moved towards programs to legalize the non-medical use of cannabis, uh, to them uh, this is also um, a policy measure for which they have a, a set of objectives and, uh, 
um, and part of those objectives is, is obviously to, uh, um, um, together with a set of um, preventive and educational programs in, uh, in line with that, that they hope to be able to uh, contain or reduce the use of cannabis, but at the same time to, uh, um, to reduce the illegal market of, uh, of, of cannabis. Now, the, the countries that have moved in that direction, some of them, they have put in place a monitoring framework. So, um, and uh, at this point in time, but, uh, you know, it may be still too soon to judge what, what, what is happening uh, and whether those objectives that are, you know, are set forth in those policies, um, you know, whether they will, whether they will be fulfilled. Um, but you know, to come back to the uh, uh, to the to the public health indications again, um, uh, there the role of the board is is specific in in that uh, in that respect. We are, um, uh, if you look at the the preamble and the uh, the objective of the conventions, where we talk about availability and access of uh, of controlled substances for medical use. So those countries that have medical programs for cannabis. Um, where they make that decision or where they have programs for, for other controlled substances, there it is important that those substances are actually available. Here, we're, again, we're talking about the non-medical use and um, the, um, the harmful effects of uh, controlled substances. That's why they are controlled uh, under the international conventions. Uh, they're there because there's the, the, the fear and in many cases there is the evidence that they can have harmful effects. Now, in the course of the years, obviously, um, harm of uh, substances, um, um, there's always, um, you know, a benefit-risk ratio when you, talk about, uh, when you talk about substances. They may have medical effects, they may have beneficial effects, but they also may have harmful effects. And in the course of, as the evidence grows, that, uh, that, that balance may also shift. But at this point in time and why countries have decided, you know, to, uh, uh, to put these substances under international control was particularly uh, uh, also because there are harmful effects. Now, as you know, the next week, uh, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs will be discussing the, the classification of cannabis and that is one expression uh, of, um, uh, of countries and of state parties to have a, um, a, a re-look at whether the classification of cannabis is appropriate as it was made in 1961, because since 1961, we're almost 60 years further down the road, so medical uh, um, evidence has, has evolved, and uh, therefore that will be on the agenda based on the, on the scientific evaluation by WHO. Thank you very much. Uh, please, um, Mr. President of the Correspondents Association. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abdullah Sharif, and I'm repre representing Horn of Africa News Agency. Uh, in the report, as uh, uh, like in the previous years, Africa uh, is being described as a transit uh, area for the drugs, and uh, in the report, in the four or five pages uh, report uh, regarding Africa, I notice uh, that uh, the example of Kenya and the use of uh, uh, drugs among the pupils and young people could be also taken for Sudan and other countries. Last uh, month I was in Sudan and I noticed the increasing use of drugs among the student of the universities, chemical drugs, and also there is uh, rumors that the, some people from the uh, previous government in Sudan also involved in drugs. I don't know to which uh, extent you have information uh, regarding these accusations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, um, I, don't, I don't have, at least as far as I, I recall, I don't think that we have specific information in that respect, but we definitely share your concern. Um, um, as, as I stated, uh, I think it is very important that we, uh, um, particularly also in Africa, that we get much better data on, 
on drug use patterns and uh, um, because at this point in time, uh, many countries don't don't really collect this in a very systematic and uh, and a regular in a regular manner. Um, it's also clear that you know over historically, where we had a, a, a rather you know clear distinction between drug producing countries, drug transit countries, and drug use countries. I think those boundaries have clearly been blurring very much that um, nowadays with synthetic drugs every country can be a drug producing country uh, drug transit countries also are drug user <coughs> countries and drug producing countries are drug using countries so i think the um, again the whole nature of that problem has become much more general and uh, we definitely share your concern about the um, the, the expanded you the apparently the ex the expansion of drug use also in in countries in Africa. Um, I think last year um, uh, UNODC together with uh, EU funding they made a large uh, um, together with the Nigerian government they made a large survey on drug use in uh, in Nigeria uh, with with quite. Um, you know, concerning uh, and worrisome outcomes of, you know, high prevalence of, um, of, of drug use as, as well. And I think it would be um, important that, uh, that all countries actually engage in, you know, very systematic uh, uh, data collection on this that will allow to get a better understanding and then also will allow to, uh, uh, to design and, and implement national policies to, to try to contain this. So. So we share your concern. Okay. Just checking for further questions. So please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I decided to adapt myself to this uh, format and not to present a formal a statement about that, but to rephrase what uh, concerns uh, my delegation in two questions. Uh, the first one is um, uh, the coca cultivation in Colombia has been growing for the last year and uh, from 2013 to 2017 uh, that uh, the coca cultivation grew 3.7 times. But from 2017 to 2019, that means at the end of the 2018, there was uh, a decrease of one point three percent or something. Um, that's the facts. But uh, in the in the report, in the pa in paragraph five four eight and five four nine, uh, the the board calls that uh, reduce um, that uh, that that decrease as as insignificant. I think. Uh, the use of the word insignificant here not only is not um, is not um, how to say that does not correspond with the reality because we have been having a big increase and now we are decreasing it's not that much but if you if, if you see the the um, the tendency uh, now is is totally totally different. Uh, the use of insi in insignificant uh, <coughs> is not the, 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 the appropriate one. Uh, and that could uh, imply that uh, the uh, board does not understand really the situation in, the, in, in, in that specific country uh, and diminish the efforts to, to, to get that results. Uh, my government had been doing a lot of efforts in order to, in order to, to change the tendency in the, in the growing and uh, to have this kind of uh, qualifications uh, from one authority that we respect so much is, is quite difficult and uh, we do not understand very much why. And you will see, Mr. President, uh, in, 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 in uh, these days, today, tomorrow, uh, in the journals in Colombia, the, the notice will be INCB says that the Colombian reduction of the coca crops is insignificant. Uh, that's that's uh, something that uh, really, really worries us. 
And I would like to know what the reasons that uh, INCD includes that kind of word uh, in, the, in, in the report. The second question, Mr. President, is that uh, there had many, many, many paragraphs in the report. I am not going to, to, to mention all of these. Uh, and in this report and in the report of uh, precursors, in which we find out some errors some, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the figures, uh, some, some errors. And the question is, uh, are, we, are we send a note, a note uh, through the Secretariat uh, showing, highlighting those errors? Are you going to uh, review uh, the, the, the presentation, of the, the, the information, and if you corroborate that there are some errors, are you going to produce any kind of uh, federata or something like that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And um, well, first of all, to say that we uh, uh, we very much uh, uh, appreciate the uh, the efforts of, of your government over the last uh, many years. Um, obviously, um, uh, coca and cocaine has been, uh, you know, one of the, the the top political issues in Colombia for for many many years, and uh, we all know the uh, the great implications it has had in. Uh, on, on Colombia, on, on, on the government, on politics, but also particularly on its, uh, on its <coughs> people. And uh, we, we greatly, uh, you know, appreciate the, uh, the efforts and we, we acknowledge the, uh, the, the tremendous, um, well, also, you know, politman, commitment, but also the dangers that, that are, uh, you know, uh, that, that are linked with, with that. And uh, I think, um, you know, both the board as well as the international community, uh, you know, appreciates that, uh, that, that very much. Um, in terms of the, you know, the specific word that you were that you were calling, that you were calling at, I, I um, again, I think it, it's it's probably how you know people may may interpret that. Um, I, I can I can imagine that from your point of view, the fact that you know an, an, an increase has been uh, um, has been changed to a decrease in itself, you know, is is significant. I think the insignificant word or the word insignificant particularly related to the fact that it was 1%. But I think the fact that uh, your, the, the efforts of your government are bearing fruit in terms of you know, decrease um, uh, are important. I think it's also probably an issue, is that a sustainable decrease or is it, uh, you know, is it a one-off? Is, is, it, is it a matter of weather conditions or you know, is it a matter of uh, you know, an, an issue of specific measures that the government has taken so um, uh, so probably there's you know some some longer term effects to be looked at that um, uh, as well in terms of uh, of data let's say the um, the data that we uh, that we use in the report um, in principle they always come from data that are published by by governments by uh, un other un agencies um, as we're all dealing with illicit markets um, you know data may differ, they may not all coincide, they may deal with different periods of time. So I think it's, it's inevitable uh, that, um, that there may be differences in, in the data that, uh, that, that, that we produce um, and that we, uh, that we indicate in the, in, in the report. As we, um, of course, within our own system that we have in the board in collecting annual statistics from countries in uh, doing the work on estimates and assessment, we have a consistent process in which we try to do that. We can already see that um, very often the data that we get from countries, we have questions about that, you know, are they appropriate? Why are these enormous differences from one year to another? So I think that, that remains an, an, an issue of concern under the, um, um, under the dialogue that we have with countries and particularly also under the, uh, the INCB e-learning program, we're doing a lot of work uh, with countries to try to, uh, to improve annual statistics, to try to uh, improve the uh, annual data gathering uh, in, in that respect and we will continue to, uh, to do that. But I, I cannot guarantee that um, you know, from now on there, uh, there will not be uh, questions on, uh, on data but uh, Rest assured that we, uh, you know, we, we do use the data from 
from the UN system and from national governments to, uh, to inform our annual report. Thank you very much, um, please, ma'am. I, I would uh, d d uh, ask that, uh, that we stick to, to, to questions, please. Thank yes. you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us member states to also participate in the discussion. And I thank uh, the president, uh, Mr. Dion Her, for your presentation and to you as well, Mr. Uh, Director. Um, just a very quick uh, statement because at the outset, I just wish to register that, my fil that the Philippine government has some concerns regarding uh, portions of the INCB report, in particular, those that refer to the Philippine efforts to effectively address the pervasive menace and destructive effects of illegal uh, drugs in my country. As you know, the Philippines' anti-drug, anti-illegal drug strategy is multidimensional and comprehensive. And my government also acknowledges the, that the problem of illegal drugs needs a holistic and human rights-based approach. I also wish to emphasize that the Philippines has fully complied with its treaty obligations under the three international drug control conventions and will continue to do so. And in the process of constructively engaging with the INCB, we are just concerned that the process of treaty compliance uh, monitoring may be politicized. And we are also concerned that the board in uh, its report has commented on issues that may be beyond its mandate and not under its purview. So my question is, how do we member states in our constructive engagement with the INCB be ensured that the board does not allow the process to be politicized and for the board to be able to remain with its mandate. And that said, the Philippines hopes to constructively engage with the INCB and welcomes positive cooperation with a view to enhancing member states' capacity to implement fully the relevant drug conventions control conventions. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're running out of time. I can see two, two last questions. So um, uh, please, let, why don't we take the two questions? Okay, Robert Lisman from Zutoch Zeitung. Um, just a, a quick question or remark. I'm, I'm following international drug policy since many years. And uh, I was following also the Angus process of uh, 2016 when a couple of disappointed countries, let's uh, call them like this, uh, were asking for a new uh, Angus process and uh, were looking for a possible change of the conventions. Uh, what we saw wasn't a, a change of the conventions, but uh, explicitly um, allowance for a broader specter of interpretations. I can easily imagine that this doesn't make the work of the board more easy because uh, it makes it more difficult to draw clear lines possibly uh, till uh, which is and which is not uh, in accordance with the conventions. How do you see this uh, uh, concern? Let's take it like this. Can we we're just uh, take the, the, the last question over here and then the, the, the president will be able to answer both uh, in one hit. Thank you. Well, uh, it is just organizational because uh, we as uh, journalists, we come here, of course, there is a report and it is press conference. Some states, uh, of course, uh, they have uh, uh, their own opinion about the report and I was a, uh, I was a witness many years ago also a representative of one country came to the uh, press conference and he, he wanted to give a state and the organizers stopped him and after he, he went out I advised him because we as journalists he could prepare a paper or maybe he could call also for a press conference himself not for example to make this press uh, conference for his statement or to take the time so this is just you know for the next uh, uh, conferences to avoid 
But I see that today the organizers, they are so kind also to give uh, a tie, uh, possibility to some states, to, uh, to some countries to say their states. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to uh, to to respond to your uh, your, your question or, or concern, um, um, it, it, uh, uh, indeed, I cannot. Um, you know, we're we're not. Uh, um, how should I say? Um, it, the world is not getting easier in that uh, in that respect. I can fully uh, I, I can fully uh, um, uh, endorse your your concern in in, in that respect. Um, uh, clearly, I think. Uh, you know what? What we are seeing is that there are a number of developments that um, you know that are uh, taking place with uh, regard to cannabis, but also with regard to uh, to synthetic drugs um, that uh, we have called attention to um, a, as a board. Um, again, sometimes the lines are very clear. Sometimes the lines are not so clear, and 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 particularly, I think. Um, the issue of, um, of, of synthetic drugs um, and the way that is sort of changing, uh, you know, the, the nature of the drug problem, I think is something that, um, you know, that the state parties will need to, need to address. Next week in the Commission on Nar Narcotic Drugs, as I already indicated, we, we have presented a series of options, uh, you know, for um, a, 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 a better, addressing the problem of precursors and pre-precursors, because obviously we can all see that, um, you know, uh, controlling another uh, 20,000 chemical substances is really not going to, uh, to solve this problem. So um, I think we, we do have some very fundamental um, issues around uh, the conventions that, uh, that state parties will, will need to start looking at. And, um, uh, Again, we have to, uh, you know, to, to recognize that the conventions were drawn up um, 50 and 60 years ago, almost. Uh, next year's we'll, we'll have an anniversary on, uh, in, in that respect. And, um, and I think it is um, an, an appropriate time to, um, uh, to look at um, whether those are still fit for purpose or whether we need uh, new um, Alternative instruments and alternative approaches uh, to deal with these uh, with these problems. Now, um, from uh, a state party point of view, um, negotiations are always uh, are always complicated, of course. So I'm I'm, I'm not sure if uh, countries are lining up to do that. But I think uh, we owe it to the people of the world to ensure that uh, you know what we agree upon in an international in, in an international setting is actually um, effective in, 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 in dealing with a problem that I think we are all very concerned about and uh, particularly the way it is spreading and the way it is, um, you know, it, it, it is affecting uh, the world both in terms of public health but also in terms of um, illicit trafficking and all the implications that it has for, um, for, for states and the way it, it, it functions. So, so I think we, we, we share that concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. On that note, I'd like to thank you for, for coming. I'd like to thank the President and also Barbara uh, for being here. Wish you all the best. Thank you.